So, um, first of all, uh, I'm very humbled to stand in front of you. In my um, life, I've done simple things like building spacecraft, developing intelligent weapon systems and autonomous vehicles for off-road conditions. And I have always known that everything we do is enabled by cyber security, because no one would trust these things if we can't be sure that the, the control of the systems will be maintained by human operators. Thank you. So, um, in this presentation, I would like to share with you the main challenges, hopes of developers of uh, intelligent weapon systems to support our infantry uh, for on ground operation theater, and um, bring out some elements there which are mostly dependent on cyber aspects. So uh, maybe starting from general background on technology trends and developments, with uh, pointing out how it links to the work we do today on development of intelligent uh, uh, ground robotic systems, then talking about uh, standardized approach towards the future, uh, our efforts for uh, Europe to uh, develop our uh, standard architecture for unmanned ground vehicle-based systems, and uh, then uh, I will also show you a lot of videos so you would not fall asleep. And maybe this is exactly the good times to start with one, so that would we'll be on the same page in understanding what I am talking about, what kind of systems. So about this video, I have to apologize to my friends, our friends at the Patria, the famous Finnish defense company, because they got very mad at looking, when looking at this video, because that was their APC shot dead by blanks and all the smoke around it. So they said, Fiti Cal would not shoot through our armor. <laughs> Sorry. Andexi. So, um, with our good partners from different, uh, different uh, NATO allies, we have put together different uh, systems like that, both to support for dismounted infantry on, and also for uh, cooperation with mechanized infantry at high speeds. So, uh, but before we go into more detail about this development, uh, just to rephrase your memory, uh, just to uh, remind you about the most uh, relevant reference book in NATO nowadays, which is the Science and Technology Trends 2020-2040 document developed by NATO Science and Technology Organization. And we all know in this hall what the future will bring. We know the trends, we know the, the, the baseline uh, of, uh, things that, uh, that establish these trends. But when uh, you want to know what NATO has agreed upon, then the approach is described in this document. I'm pretty sure all of you have read it. But now when we look at uh, unmanned ground systems, for example, then the future is now. Today, uh, now it's only 2020. Uh, uh, 22, and we're already 
developed systems that you saw in the, the video before that well, sure, digital, but also distributed. And, uh, well, I strongly believe that the main battle tank is history, as we see evidence arising also from uh, Russian war on Ukraine. And uh, we believe that that kind of distributed, smaller, uh, more mobile, less uh, protected uh, robotic systems will uh, uh, be the future of the battlefield. But in order to be distributed, surely they have to be interconnected. And we see that through flexible use of different uh, radio channels, like tactical communication, different satellite communication channels, including Starlink, and uh, then using different frequencies, going to very high frequencies, uh, which would uh, not travel far in atmosphere, but on the other hand, they would be very difficult to jam at slower, the lower, um, shorter distances we see this interconnected uh, happening soon and intelligent from the point of view that point of view of ground systems so um, we will surely have time delays in communication and we surely have communication jamming and uh, and break breakdown of communication so from our point of view intelligence at the platform level uh, should maintain the operation of the system e even if the communication is lost and i think parallel could be brought from simple infantry soldier in comparison with a special, a special uh, branch soldier. So simple infantry still needs uh, to be close to his sergeant and get uh, commands on regular basis, while spe spe uh, special operation branch soldier could maybe uh, operate for weeks and as intelligent the knowledge and training to uh, make a lot of independent decisions. Well, that very nicely aligns with uh, when we analyze what is the capability of our current robotic assets. So based on these trends, NATO listed us a set of, uh, set of technology, uh, technologies that will shape the battlefield most during the next 18 years. And we are very much linked in this uh, discussion with autonomous systems, artificial intelligence and big data. So um, we have a lot of uh, legal and uh, experts in the hall and um, and a lot of technical experts here. So I was proud to be a committee put together by IEEE two years ago, which uh, analyzed what kind of support IEEE could provide to uh, developers or uh, procurement agencies or users of uh, autonomous weapon systems of the future. So this is a public document. You can find it online. We uh, put together, well, first we analyze the task we were given and we came to a conclusion that within a two years perspective that we had ahead of us, we can't solve any of these questions. What we can do is to list the questions. So uh, this report is about questions and this is just uh, the table of contents. These are the titles and all the questions are under these titles, uh, different categories. Unfortunately, you cannot see uh, cyber security and cyber defense here as a main title. Uh, well, if I would have had position I will have starting from August, then I would have made sure that cyber defense, especially cooperative cyber defense, would have been one of the, one of the titles there. But, well, currently it's underlying and in very different, uh, different uh, roles uh, throughout this, uh, this list of challenges and questions that needs to be answered uh, before we can deploy um, weapon systems with significant intelligence and autonomous, autonomous functions. So um, now I apologize for, uh, for all uh, legal experts in the hall, but from my simple engineering perspective as a company rep, I would say that uh, when we see as a question what is legal and ethical in the autonomous uh, system side today, then we can say probably that uh, sort of think about the vehicle you saw in the forest uh, in the first, first video. So there are some things that are clearly legal and ethical, for example, human in the loop, full remote control, uh, shooting an uh, enemy tank. Or then there are some things that are clearly legal and unethical. For example, uh, the same vehicle program to uh, run around uh, downtown Tallinn and uh, kill all civilian uh, close children uh, it can see. So, and a lot of uh, unclarity in between being debated. From industry perspective, it would be extremely important to draw the line because our investments and business decisions 
depend on that heavily. So uh, it's important for Blue, yeah, Jana very nicely described, much more professionally, sees it's pretty much the same question. I don't believe that Putin can be, uh, can be trusted on saying anything on, uh, on, the, uh, on the behavior of, uh, of his nation. But um, what we will do is to stick to our values and principles. And if we have agreed on the line, we will most likely maintain it. I'm I believe that so on the red side, if, of course, it would be much more wise to uh, prohibit everything they can, allow as little as possible, and extend the gray zone as well, because they don't care anyways. That makes a difference between the blue and the red. So in different working groups, uh, in NATO Industrial Advisory Group and NATO Advisory Group on Emerging and Disruptive Technologies, we have analyzed what NATO can do uh, to, be, to maintain the lead in this technological, uh, technological race. And um, I just picked some of the recommendations from these groups that might be uh, relevant to this audience as well. And uh, first and foremost, uh, there is a, some people might be afraid that uh, countries like China, for example, they have this enormous uh, capability to focus resources on key technologies. But we believe that NATO, which is diverse, one could say it's weak because resources are scattered. But uh, through this anal analysis, our uh, working group agreed that uh, actually, as uh, natural, na natural diversity is a baseline for evolution, so is diversity in business and academia, it is a baseline for innovation. And that's the number one strength for NATO as a huge, diverse organization. And we only need to turn this into our strength. That means pick up this innovation, fruits of innovation, and turn them into mature uh, systems defending our nations. And for that, we emphasized three key elements, open architectures, interoperability and modularity of the system. And while uh, interoperability, for example, has been there forever in NATO, it's very important stuff, but we also emphasize that in the future, these AI-based, uh, for example, battlefield management systems and, uh, and autonomous uh, weapon system might become so complicated that it's almost impossible for a single company to develop the best in the world solution. Most likely we see modularity or modular architectures that would enable different different stakeholders from different, uh, different nations to contribute into these systems. For example, the vehicle that you saw in the forest, uh, it had, of course, very simple level uh, weapons from uh, Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, Kongsbury, and, uh, and uh, vehicle itself from Milram, and so on and so on. But on autonomous side, we're developing this kind of standardized autonomous navigation kit architecture in uh, one uh, European project I mentioned uh, later that allows different uh, uh, companies, startups who develop intelligent uh, navigation functionality for that type of uh, environment to be plugged in to this, uh, this backbone to enable more efficient, uh, more efficient intelligent navigation kit for the system. Very important, that has been also mentioned here before today, is uh, actually the education and training of the military personnel. And uh, our commission, committee in this, uh, this one of the groups puts this first. Because, well, as point three says, technological innovation is nothing without doctrinal innovation, if we talk about disruptive innovation. So, so technologies that will really transform the way we fight our wars. That means if we fight it the old way with new technology, it's almost useless. So our officers should be trained to, to understand the capabilities the new technology will provide them in the future, distant future, even if this technology doesn't really exist yet which means actually coming to the point four, that means that industry and, and uh, uh, military stakeholders have to start cooperating much in much earlier stages. When the idea is born, then academia, industry and military stakeholders have to come together to figure out how in 10 years when this technology will be eventually mature, by that time our doctrines would be adapted already to this new capability. And uh, point six, 
I would emphasize, um, it was mentioned here as well, so uh, how do we get to uh, all these different nations and even more importantly, one billion NATO citizens with the message that we have. And uh, one thing that we thought was that, well, it's very easy to say that, well, this industry, they are killer robot developers. They should be prohibited. And NATO, well, they accept killer robots, so they are bad. And why we leave that kind of discussion uh, to be initiated and uh, initiative in the hand of uh, those who would like to, maybe not being very technically correct, uh, to prohibit everything that could be of help to our defense. So we very uh, strongly uh, uh, suggested that NATO should take the lead, take the initiative in open transparent discussion, which very nicely was mentioned by Joanna as well. Exactly on autonomous uh, robotic side, it's very much applicable. And that would, I have never thought about it before, like you said, but you said that it also has very strong implications to the other nations in between. So I think they are afraid of killer robots as well. So. Uh, now, talking about how this development has been uh, ongoing with um, uh, related infantry supporting support systems based on that type of vehicles. Well, uh, just now a little bit uh, about the technology. Here is an um, example of... Uh, now, a photo is being taken. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> Well, I need, to, I need to give you a treat as well, because I was making a joke. I know you, uh, you all envy me, because you still have to be sitting, and I could come out and do some exercises. So please, guys, everybody, stand up and look around one shoulder, look around the other shoulder, and feel uh, refreshed for a moment. And once more, situational awareness. Every soldier needs to know what's behind him or her. And now you are allowed to sit back. I hope you feel better. So, with these modular systems, um, what we propose the future battlefield will look like is a combination of these modular uh, mobility capability combined with different payloads, different weapon systems, uh, UXV-based systems, drones and ground assets that would actually meet exactly the criteria that NATO scientists have predicted, intelligent, interconnected, distributed, digital. And in order to, now coming back to the statements that we need to be ready for the future, now the process that would be bring together technology, awareness and military thinking and military science, we uh, come to the tactical and doctrinal innovation through concept development and experimentation. So how these systems are used on the battlefield. So at Milram, my, my responsibility as uh, science and development uh, director, most importantly, is to work with stakeholders to analyze stakeholder needs, I don't even go to stakeholder requirements level. Because what we see is most important is to work together with military stakeholders to understand how this technology will reform the battlefield. And we use this kind of classical process uh, in this analysis. First, we look at the conceptual uh, frameworks, how, uh, what we want to achieve in our uh, war fighting, for example, breaking deliberate defense. Then we list most relevant operation concepts that we uh, we need to dis we have described in a report. Uh, for example, how UXV uh, UXS uh, enables operations in urban area, like uh, uh, UXS enabled uh, enhanced situational awareness, uh, enabled uh, spearhead cutting dispersed adversary, adversary lines of communications, and so on. And then we adapt this to some certain scenario and we turn it into concept of operation and then we split it back again into a huge list of user stories and use cases which are based on uh, soldier's view, team view, section view, uh, platoon view, company view, battalion view and so on. And from another side, all that again will be divided into uh, battlefield functions like uh, effect on logistics, on protection and sustainability, on engagement, mobility, command and control, intelligent readiness, deployment. And all that goes into use cases. And now this analysis, which we can't do alone, this we do together with our friendly armed forces per personnel, we uh, come to the 
set of stakeholder needs that will define our uh, requirements eventually for our uh, infantry support systems, which basic architecture is that it consists of the vehicle platform, vehicle smart mobility solution, payload on top of it, communication solution, which has to be very, very capable, and command and control solution, which would be linked into larger battlefield management system eventually. So um, how we do it? Um, this cooperative, uh, concept development and experimentation. Actually, we thank NATO, ACT. We uh, are very, we very, very much appreciate NATO, ACT being de having been developed the CD and E handbook, which uh, describes a standardized procedure how to analyze if we have new technology or capability gap in our uh, our capability uh, for our national defense and how this new technology can solve this capability gap. Using this standardized procedure, companies like us, working together with uh, stakeholders from, uh, from armed forces, we basically can provide two types of supports. And I'm sorry, I have to say that this is it's not sales pitch. Don't come and buy this service from Milram. I'm talking about the principles, how we should cooperate in detail, whatever company we talk about. <laughs> So uh, uh, companies like uh, says industry can provide armed forces with uh, technical support, for example, putting together a UXV-based system with, uh, from many different companies. And actually, I'm telling you the story of Italy. Italy started, uh, did a procurement last year, and uh, they established five years process to, uh, to find answer to a question how uh, UXV-based systems would transform urban warfare during next five to 15 years. And Milram is proud to be now industry partner together with a large consortium of UAV and UXV develop, UGV developers supporting now Italian armed forces to uh, find solutions to that question based on ACT, CD and E uh, handbook uh, procedure. And by providing technical support with all the technology and providing then uh, also methodological support to the officers of the, uh, uh, of the headquarters. So uh, here is a video demonstrating what it actually means, because when we do the, the theory part first, then we need to, be, uh, need to go to the battlefield and experiment how it works. I have two examples, two videos. First one is uh, in cooperation with Estonian, uh, one of the Estonian artillery battalions, and uh, the, um, it was live firing exercise. And the question the officers asked was how that type of robotics could support uh, operations of a battalion, uh, artillery battalion. Here, our system is in two functions. First, uh, one vehicle uh, with, uh, with uh, kinetic payload is supporting forward positioned infantry squad, both for uh, giving suppressive and cover fire, and also helping to, uh, to increase mobility of infantry by, uh, uh, by uh, helping to, uh, to uh, carry their heavy gear. And the second unit it helps to uh, helps in targeting with a desert drone.
multifunctional combat and combat service support. So, that was now one example from uh, in cooperation with Estonian Armed Forces. The next video is in cooperation with Latvian Armed Forces. Slightly different scenario. So with that, uh, we have come to a um, more systematic view on this infantry system and uh, a European Defence Fund has uh, initiated one of, the, uh, one of its projects is about unmanned ground systems. Milram Robotics is very proud to lead the project and we have a lot of uh, very honoured partners and I'm pretty sure a lot of people from these companies are in the uh, audience today as well. So uh, the idea is now to establish the European basic architecture for that type of systems and different elements of the architecture or, and the project are integration with different payloads, um, swarming and cooperative behavior of different assets, operation scenarios for, uh, with manned and unmanned assets, cooperation, a new uh, artificial intelligence based um, navigation solutions for the systems, integrated communication solution based on uh, different available assets, and um, control, command and control of the system with the capabilities, and last but not least, development of cyber defense system for that architecture. And with cyber defense, which also is uh, led by Estonian company Talgen, this, um, this architecture or this cyber the challenges here are that, well, if we have this uh, quite large system and many components from different providers, so cyber challenges uh, start already from uh, controlling the supply chain and then they continue by uh, physical uh, uh, tampering with, uh, with uh, parts of the, the system, then uh, intrusion from different, uh, different uh, entry points to the system and so on and so on and what will happen if the uh, enemy captures some of the vehicles, how uh, should we respond, so, uh, so detection and response to uh, cyber attacks is the main uh, focus of this research. So uh, the CD and the effort, it's uh, extensive together with very many different uh, nations, UK, US, uh, Netherlands, Italy, Estonia and, and so on and so on. So, um, uh, to conclude this discussion is that, uh, of course, we have been speaking about dual use. 
And uh, from industry perspective, a company like, uh, like SAT uh, has actually much larger potential in civilian sector. And we are looking at a couple of uh, opportunities, for example, forest regeneration solution based on robotics, so planting the trees and doing the maintenance during the first five years. And you know, nobody, uh, it's, not, uh, it's, well, it's not well automated uh, today or mechanized today. It's not automated at all. It's, uh, all, it's very badly mechanized, not very efficient and it's extremely difficult to find, to find people who are willing to work with uh, do this ha uh, ha uh, simple work in the, in the brush with all these mos mosquitoes around. So our robots don't complain and that we see as a great potential for this uh, cooperation. But now I show you a video of uh, how our robots uh, uh, clean streets in Tallinn uh, when we had last snow. But now keep in mind would that vehicle be a weapon in the hands of attackers? So regardless uh, of us talking uh, from uh, about military applications or civilian applications, definitely we see that uh, proper cybersecurity solutions are the key or one of the most important enablers before they will be used actively. And this is something that our customers also ask all the time, what about cybersecurity? Actually, the second thing they ask is what about radio connection? But we have answers there. For questions about cyber uh, security, I hope you guys help us to answer all the questions. And um, at the same time, we try to be very transparent about our ethical principles. And I think every company dealing with intelligent uh, weapon systems has to pay a lot of attention to be proactive. And first, not to just react to the questions about your legal and moral aspect, uh, <laughs> profile, but uh, very well, very clearly define what is okay for us and what is not. So uh, we developed, took some time, developed our uh, policy of ethical development on systems with intelligent functions. We based it on uh, European uh, principles, and this is what we came up with. Now, uh, we don't know what the future will bring. Everybody who has uh, played uh, Ubisoft's Ghost Recon Breakpoint uh, uh, war game, say you might recognize, uh, sorry, it was a nice press release in, uh, in France that uh, Ubisoft, a French company, say, uh, say described in their press release when they released this new game, that they went to, uh, wanted to know how the future battlefield looked like, and they uh, approached the French Ministry of Defense with a question, and they were recommended to come to Tallinn and talk to Milram. So a couple of years ago, we had a very nice meeting with 10 software de designers from, game designers from uh, Ubisoft to describe how the future battlefield would look like, and this is what they came up with. They came up with uh, based on our teamies. Well, it looks, uh, looks like a killer robot to me, so maybe this picture is more peaceful as a final slide of my presentation. So uh, we are very proud that uh, uh, we could support Estonian and French troops in Operation Barkane in uh, Mali. And uh, in regular patrols, our robots supported our dismounted infantry by carrying, uh, by carrying uh, supplies and, most importantly, additional water for the troops. Um, so the second aspect of the picture is that doesn't it really look like a, like a real peacekeeping mission? When you go out with a robot like that, and all children came out and walked with a patrol throughout town and uh, uh, escorted this, uh, this uh, parade. And the last point here, that while our brave robot is uh, going first, the big brother manned vehicle is still behind. And for foreseeable future, there will be manned-unmanned cooperation, which will turn 
we'll see it within 10 years, it will turn into unmanned manned cooperation where robots go first. So that will shift the tables and turn the tables and we see quite a lot of changes during the next five to 10 years, but uh, we discuss those at next cycons. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin, Martin Norma, for such a spontaneous and active uh, presentation. And um, I don't know, did you agree? Would you be open for one question? Or well, I take, uh, can we... take all questions, but uh, probably we want to go to drink coffee. So. Uh... OK, no, then. Yeah. Thank you so much. You Thank can look me up and ask yeah. questions when you find me over there. <laughs>